Hello, everyone. Welcome to Poe on the Car. I'm so excited to be here. We're here with episode 27. My name is Chris Rivers. And I'm Mandy Mack. <laughs> yeah, and we are here with, I'm so fucking excited, with the incredible Elizabeth Thiefer. Yes! <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Honored to be invited. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we're so excited to learn a little bit more about your pole journey and all about what you do and maybe some other fun stuff too. <laughs> we're frightening, here, you know, it could go either way. Yeah. No, we'll see. <laughs> it's nice because I've been, I've been subscribed to your YouTube for quite a while. So now I'm, I get to know you besides just the tutorials. It's awesome. It's quite beautiful. <laughs> Same. I wanted to say as well, like uh, not only like inspire me with, um, you know, just your YouTube channel and everything. But I wanted to say too, when we switched to online classes and I was like, oh, what do I do for a microphone? And I noticed that you had the AirPod. So you all inspired that. I want you to know that our whole team uses the AirPods now and they're amazing. And I got it from you because you were upside down and like <laughs> and they sounding in. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. And I have, okay. Weird random fact. I have like the world's smallest ears. Like I literally have like baby size ears. Um, like I've had friends joke, like it's amazing. You can hear out of those things, but like AirPods for some, like I have the hardest time getting things to fit, but AirPods are like perfect for my ears. I can do straps, roll ups, pull, and they stay in amazing. Yeah. And I don't even get paid by Apple to say that. So. I was going to say, I wanted to let you know that maybe you should be the spokesperson. I know, like, right? <laughs> even baby ears like these. So. I love it. Yes. But yeah, so you're certainly an inspiration to many polars and in all states of um, their journeys. And as well as like, I wanted to ask some questions a little bit later too about like the business side of pole because you're really successful. And I think that a lot of pollers wonder. <laughs> a lot of us are good at poll and, and maybe not as good at the business side. Um, but but first of all, can you just let us know how, how you came to pole dance? Do you want the short version or the long version? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's complicated. Um, I would say I, I flirted with pole to start, um, little background that plays into that sort of directly, indirectly. Um, I have two boys, they're now teenagers. Um, so I started pole after having my children. Um, also once again, once again, I don't know how far back you want to go and feel free to stop me anytime. Cause you know, once you like open the blah, everything, um, I come from a very conservative Christian family. Um, <laughs> let's just say the apple has fallen a very far away from the tree. Um, so when I, my, my boys were little, I took them to like a mommy and me gymnastics class. And in the same gymnastics studio, there was a sign for pole fitness. And this was back in, oh gosh, probably that was probably like 2010, wait, 2010, 2011. Um, like it was very taboo then at that time. And this was in orange County. Um, and so I'd seen the sign a few times. It was one of those where like, I always see it in that, like, <gasps> you know, scandalous, um, but the curiosity factor and everything. Um, and so I'd walk past it all the time. And then I had, um, a friend of mine that had little kids also, and both of us had talked about like, you know, kind of that progression that so many of us go through of momhood of like, wow, we've had kids and now our whole identity is, mom. We don't even have a name anymore. Um, I feel like I'm disgusting all the time. I mean, I'm disgusting all the time anyway, but, um, more so like, because I had babies and, you know, you're constantly have like puke and yogurt smeared on you and whatever else fecal matter, who knows? Sorry. Um, but, um, just of like, you lose yourself, you know, you kind of start to lose your identity. Um, in that I also was in a less than healthy marriage. That was where those children came from, which also, contributed to losing my identity. Um, but had a girlfriend that were, and we saw advertised that there was a lap dance class and we we're like, Oh, um, we thought it'd be scandalous and fantastic. And she also was this like conservative Christian. So we went and took a lap dance class at the pole studio and I never did the lap dance for my significant other. I learned to dance, but I was so self-conscious, so horrified. Um, like I had fun, but I was just so, I wasn't comfortable with my body, myself, my everything. Um, so outside my element, but that was my first like exposure, I guess you could say, like going in a pole studio and be like, oh my gosh, like, um, and so then from there at that pole studio, because it was next to the gymnastics place, they had like a 
kind of like a daycare ish kind of thing there where you actually could, which worked out great for the pole studio. You could drop your kids off and pay. I forget what it was like 10 bucks for an hour to have them. Watch, so you could go to your class, which was amazing because I didn't have childcare help financially was not in a good place. Emotionally was not in a good place, meant all the things not in a good place. Um, but I was able to take a couple of pole classes. Um, I went maybe twice a month because I couldn't afford it, time, money, all of those things. Um, but that was my first exposure to it. Um, but at that time, it was more of the, as I'm sure a lot of pollers get the, um, what's the word? Like the people that have the, like, I want to be a stripper for the day. Like that kind of, like, I still didn't know what it was about. It just was this like, oh, it's like scandalous and it's this. But I would say the one thing that was really a pivotal changing point mentally for me was that studio did an open house performance and I went to it. I actually brought my significant other with me of like, oh, look at, like I've taken a couple of classes and let's go watch the open house. And I, I mean, I, I could probably climb. I, I mean, I was relatively strong because I was an active person, but so not coordinated, so not sexy, so not so many things. Um, but we went to this open house and there was one performer. I have no idea what this lady's name is. Like I, I, she hadn't been in any of my classes, but I watched her perform. And this once again, getting into too much background. So if I've totally tangented off the question, you know, stop me. Um, in my relationship, my person that I was married to, um, very judgmental, a fatophobe to the point where they would jokingly say that they were going to put in our prenup that if I ever weighed more than they did, that was, you know, grounds for dismissal. Um, and so in this, um, the showcase, there was this woman that came out and did a solo and she was a very curvy woman and she danced and it was the most mind blowing thing I had ever seen. And this woman was like, by everything that I was having pushed upon me, not the perfect body, you know, just the, like, you know, she's round, she's curvy. She's, you know, all this, it was the sexiest thing I have ever seen in my entire life. And I remember watching her and like, she was loving her body. And to me, I remember watching that in like, you know, my size two, you know, how dare you possibly have like an ounce of fat because you'll be ridiculed for it. I wasn't comfortable in my own skin, even though I had, you know, what I should have by what I was told. And I remember watching her and thinking, I want that. Like it has not like sexy confidence has nothing to do with what your body looks like on the outside. I wanted what she had. So to me, that was really like a, a game changer as far as how I looked at pole of like, oh, it's not this like cute, like, I don't know what, what I, I saw a potential empowerment that I didn't realize was a part of it. You know, before that, it was kind of like this party trick thing of like, oh, you do it. And then you can tell people, you know, that, oh, I took a pole class and it's scandalous and, you know, oh. um, but that to me was an eye opener. Um, it turns out I wasn't able to do a lot of pole at the time. Once again, just where I was at in my life. And it wasn't until 2012 where I officially call my beginning of my pole journey. Um, so I, I like at that time, like I said, I take an occasional class, the kind of thing where you take a class. And by the time you come back, you totally forget what you learned on and you're back at square one every single time. Um, but yeah, so I started in 2012. My number one reason why I started where I like, this is what I'm doing. Um, I was a competitive fighter and I know this gets into some of your other questions, but, um, I had a career ending injury and major knee reconstruction. I was put on bed rest for four months. Um, and I was told, you know, you need to stay away from impact sports. And at the time I'd been a long distance runner, competitive fighter, my life was impact. Um, and the doctor said, if you don't cut back on the impact sports, you're going to need a total knee replacement within five years. Cause I had bone on bone in my knees. Like you have the, the knee of an 80 year old. So I was trying to think of something low impact that still gave me, I was like, I'm going to go crazy if I can't do anything. And I remember asking my physical therapist, I was like, what about pole dancing? Like that's like upper body stuff. And he, of course, you know, gave me a funny look, um, and was like, sure that works. Um, so that's what got me started. And so it was supposed to initially be a pass the time and tell me knee heels and then screw the doctors. I'm going to go back to fighting. Um, and then turns out like so many of us, I started in pole and I got addicted. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a pole addict and life has never been the same since. So I went from, um, 
being a, uh, I was on my way to going to grad school as a nurse practitioner. My acceptance was taken away because of my knee injury. Um, and instead I decided to become a pole dancer. So I like to tell people I'm like, yeah, I was originally pre-med then went nurse practitioner and then, you know, decided to become a pole dancer instead. So there's my success story <laughs> or sad story, depending on who you ask. I think it's a fucking success, but you know, <laughs> anyways. Okay. Do you want to like tame that down? Cause I think I just like went in this big, like just no, tangent of <laughs> Have I mentioned I'm ADD? Awesome. No. <laughs> okay, yeah. so if you want to clarify any of those or go deeper, like. Love that you, I love that you shared. You got that your work cut out for you. I was a nursing student too before um, becoming a pole, choosing the pole career. So yeah. I love that you shared that. That's fucking incredible. And I can't believe the knee injury was like the end of everything, but then it was like, pole is here and you were like it, that's fine <laughs> no and it was and at the time I mean I'm sure like both of you and like so many of us what we do becomes our identity at the time um I I'd taken up fighting um competitive fighting once again one of those that started as a hobby and that dives into deeper things once again if you want to go down that rabbit hole take the blue pill you know um let me know but um so I was a competitive fighter um as I was working my way towards school, all that, it was my form of exercise, once again, became an addiction, all that. Um, and the knee injury was really psychologically traumatic because it took away my identity. Also how it happened was really traumatic. Um, someone injured me on purpose. It was, um, uh, the difference in the martial arts competitive fighting world. It's a very male dominated world and a lot of egos. Um, you get a lot of people, you know, they say that people have been victimized as children, whether that's, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically, you know, sexually, anything, usually, you know, they pick one of two ways, either they go on to become victimizers themselves because they want to make someone else feel small. So it makes them feel better, or they go on to become champions and defenders of those. Um, you get a lot of people in martial arts that they were bullied as kids and, they continue that. Um, and it turns out little girls that don't have a lot of fear, um, are not received well sometimes. So basically I embarrassed someone that outranked me and they took a cheap shot and kicked me across the room. Um, and you know, politics as there isn't anything, I ended up getting blackballed because I tried to call this person out for intentionally injuring me and ruining my career. It actually took away my acceptance to grad school. I've been accepted to grad school, but because I ended up having to go in for surgery, I missed my opening day. And so my grad school entrance was revoked, which at the time, as I'm sure, like you were saying, Chris, like when you're on that, like, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I had at the time it was like life-changing. And yet now, like, I honestly believe everything happens for a reason. I think it's the best thing in the fucking world that could have happened. Like I am, you know, at the time it was so traumatic, um, because, you know, people that I thought were my friends, people pick sides on what happened, you know, just, it was a hot mess. Um, and yet now I'm like, it's the best thing that could have happened. Like I fucking love what I do now. I love that I'm in a place where I get to have a positive impact on people's lives. Um, because I feel that strongly about pole that it's not just a fitness thing. It's a life changer for so many people, you know, it's empowering, it builds confidence, it builds strength, you know, emotionally, mentally, you know, sexual, everything. Like I, I honestly, now that knee injury is probably one of the best things that happened in my life. So as fucked up as that sounds, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always amazed at when people can, can find like the, the terrible life changing thing that happened and, and then find like the good that comes out of it and be like, wow, I'm, I'm really happy that that actually happened. I, mean, I wouldn't I'm wishing on anyone, you yeah, know, yeah, but... <laughs> of course. I mean, don't go too crazy with that, but yes. Yeah. Right. No. Cause it's, it's hard to like, it's, you can get so wrapped up in, in yeah. like, wow, I put all my time into this thing and it was your identity. Yeah. Um, and that kind of brings me around to like pole, like what, what happens if our identity is wrapped up in that? But as you say, we can always um, reinvent ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I find too. And I don't know, Chris, if you've had, cause as like you'd said, changing from like nursing and does that, I find the more times I've recreated myself in my life, the more confidence it gives me that I can do it again. Um, I mean, same with business building, we're taking away that fear of failure of like, you know what, if it turns out I lose this identity, like I can still have an impact, even if, you know, like, as I'm sure 
you know, you all know in any polar, like our bodies fail us. Um, that's something we may get into later. Um, my body's failing me. Um, it's falling apart. Um, I have genetic issues that contribute to that. Eventually there'll come a day where I won't be able to do pole most likely, but it's one of those where I'm like, that doesn't mean that I can't still contribute. That doesn't mean that I can't still make a difference. So I think it's one of those, like when you have those things and you're like, oh, okay. It's not like I, you know, went down a hole and disappeared. Like you still have something to give. Yeah. I love that. Well, that's a, that's quite a story that I was not expecting at all. <laughs> I told you, careful what you ask. It's like, no. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but it's true what you say. Sometimes um, reinventing yourself, like you find you truly want things you didn't even know you wanted. What you thought at that time you really wanted isn't what you really wanted. It's right? Yeah. So true. Yeah, I got fired, and that's how I ended up doing poll. I was working at an ad agency for so long and then they were like get out of here and I was like what do I do (laughs) yeah which probably at the time was like scary frustrating and yet if they hadn't would you have made the change maybe maybe not right I definitely wouldn't (laughs) (laughs) these times we just need to be shoved off a cliff every now and then right (laughs) yeah I definitely like that (laughs) the universe knows who I am (laughs) But so you, um, you were a fighter. Did you do any other movement background? Were you a dancer or anything like that? I, I've done a lot of things. Um, growing up, I grew up in a big family, um, seven kids. So um, it turns out when you have seven kids, um, you all play soccer. Um, because it turns out, and I didn't know this until I was a, a parent myself with AYSO, which is, you know, the soccer organization you pay for the first kid. I think you get a discount on the second kid, a discount on the third, and then it's free for the kids after that. Cause they're like, if you have that many fucking kids, God help you. So my family pushed soccer. I was not a fan of soccer. Um, so, you know, I did it as a little kid was never that good. At, I was a hack. Um, all my siblings or most of my siblings were really good at it. Um, including my sister who was above me, um, age up. And when I was like 12, I had a friend that wanted to do ballet. And as much of a tomboy as I was, I was like, I want to take ballet. Um, family of seven kids, finances, very tight, seven kids on a single family income. Um, and so my mom was like, okay, you can do one ballet class a week. Plus also on that note, we lived in BFE, um, little tiny town called forest Hill, as in like, to the point where in the winter time, the power would go out every winter. Cause either a, someone would crash into a pole or you get snowed in and the power. So like, not only was it like the money commitment of like, oh my gosh, it was like $30 a month. It's like 30 bucks for one class now. But at that time, that was a lot. Um, but even just the commute, she was like, I'll drive you to class one day a week. Cause we'd even say, I'm going to town. Um, that's how far away from civilization we were. Um, so she agreed to let me do one class a week. And as I did it, and it turns out, I it turns out my joint disorder was to an advantage in ballet because I actually have a, a 180 turnout, which the average person doesn't have. Um, I don't work it anymore, but you know, it's there somewhere hidden under some cobwebs. Um, so I had like some potential. And so for me to go to like, wait, I don't want to play soccer and it's not my thing and everything, but something where like someone says I have potential. And so I worked very hard. I wanted to do more classes, but of course, like parents were, that's it. So at 12 years old, I went and walked myself down to the local horse ranch that was like a mile or two down the road, asked them if I could have a job mucking stalls. Um, And I started mucking stalls so that I could earn money to pay for dance classes. And then of course had to beg rides off of my older siblings that could drive so that I could get a ride to dance class so that I could go dance five days a week so that I could work my way up to being on point. Um, So I did classical ballet, but then by the time I got to about 16, 17, um, which also total side note, I was homeschooled. Um, so about 16, 17, I had surpassed where my parents were able to take me with homeschooling. Um, cause I wanted to go to medical school. I had all these big plans. I was going to get out of this small town. Um, and so about 16, 17, the ballet Academy that I was going to is actually run by a well-known ballet mistress. Um, and it's actually as an adult, I went and took a ballet class at a 
studio in a totally different part of California, despite the fact it had been two decades since I'd done ballet, apparently even their port bras have like a signature to them. Um, and I was taking a class and the lady teaching was like, who did you train under? And I said the lady's name and she was like, mm, I thought I recognized that. And I was like, oh, so the lady who taught, which I got lucky that in this small town, this is where this lady had retired to. She had been the ballet mistress for the Metropolitan Ballet, the Boston Ballet, the Royal Ballet. Like she had been everywhere. Granted, if any of you have ever seen the movie, The Emperor's New Groove, are you familiar? Okay, Yzma, that's what this lady looked like. Um, <laughs> and kind of the same personality, which is kind of typical in ballet. But um, but I would say she pushed me to do more than, you know, also, you know, there's, there's a lot of unhealthy habits that go with that, eating disorders and things like that. Um, had those, had my share of those. Um, but yeah, so I did ballet and then basically about 16 years old um, was offered the opportunity to audition for a ballet company. And basically at that point, it was either A, do I go to college or do I join a ballet company? And I literally looked at this woman who was the teacher who like said, I have no idea how old she was, but I literally looked at her and was like, you know, when you're, when you're 16, 40 is like, oh my gosh, that's so old. I don't know how old she was, but looking at her, this person that was like in pain could barely walk. And I thought, is that what I want to be? Like, you know, do it, is that, and she was not a happy person. Like she smoked, she drank. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know her life story or anything, but, it, but I literally looked at that and I was like, no, I'm going to go to college. So I started college at 16, gave up ballet. Yeah. So I had a few years from like 12 to 16. I worked my ass off, but I had a few years of dance. So it's there. It's just like covered under a lot of dust and shrapnel and scar tissue. No. <laughs> so, and then long distance runner, competitive fighter. There was some pole vaulting in there in college. So. Mover forever. <laughs> yeah, but nothing like creative though. That was one of the things wow. I found when I first started pole. I remember going to one of my first pole classes and the teacher was like, and you're just going to like touch yourself. And I was like, like, I don't right. like ballet, ballet, like in traditional, like they do not encourage creativity. They do not encourage individuality. Like everyone's bun looks exactly the same, the same bobby pins, the same leotard, like free dance to me, like in class. And when I first started, they're like, they always did a free dance into class. And I always find a reason to leave early. It'd be like five minutes till I'm like, oh, I got to go home and wash my cat. I, I I'd stay. I'd love to, but I can't. So I always found a reason to duck out of free dance in the beginning. Cause it was horrifying. So, <laughs> so that one took you, a long time to find. <laughs> uh, how do you feel about free dance now? Do you, do you have I more love it. Yay. Oh, no. I, yeah, I love it. And actually it's one of the things that I love teaching. Like I actually do a workshop. That's like a low flow workshop and I love teaching it because it didn't come natural to me. Um, I found that's as I'm sure like a lot of pullers, we always learn from a lot of people throughout our years. Um, I remember having some instructors that trying to learn from them and they were trying to show me their style. And it was one where it was just like, but my body doesn't look like yours. It doesn't move like, and it, it like frustrated and puzzled me at the same time. And it was years before I finally had someone that, and it seems so like obvious, but it, for some reason it wasn't to me where they said to me one day and they said, you need to stop trying to move like me. And I was like, what do you mean? They said, you'll never move like me. And I was like, oh, like, that's so mean. And then when she actually explained it, she said, you'll never move like me because you're not me. She said, you need to learn how to move like you. And it was like, it was a liberating thing of like, oh, you know, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's something where like, so I love teaching flow now because I think it is a lot of people come into it. If you don't have a dance background, like I said, I can say I have a dance background. I have ballet, but to me, okay. It helped with my toe points, my micro bed. It didn't help with me. creativity. It didn't help with my comfort with my body by no means. I would say ballet is the complete opposite and comfort of your body. Um, cause there's like, you have to look a certain way and move a certain way. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I love helping people find that because there's no wrong. It's, you know, how does your body move? Like if I tell everyone to do hip circles, some people might go clockwise. Some people might go counterclockwise. I'm like, you got to learn how to find where your body goes and play with it. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. We all have clunky moments where like you very unceremoniously, unsexily like flop on the floor. And then you're like, okay, how can I make this better? You know, <laughs> or how can I do this different? Maybe not even better, just different. So, yeah. but yeah, so I, I actually really enjoy working with people like that with, with that, because I understand the fear and the discomfort, if that makes sense. It was very uncomfortable in the beginning. 
Yeah. That's good to hear that like um the story of like overcoming it because for some people it's like so easy, but some people it's really terrifying. I know for me, like I used to cry when I had to be in front of someone and do something that yeah. came from me. I was like, ah. Um, it took me a while, but yeah, it's it's definitely something to be learned. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I think that is one of the things that's great about poll. I mean, that's once again, where you can say like, would you have found that comfort if you hadn't started poll? You know, cause I feel like that is for so many of us, we have that like fear of judgment, you know, whether it's, you know, from society, from, you know, personal interactions with family, friends, significant others, whatever it is. But that's one of the things I find the most about poll is like being confident in yourself, you know, of just being like, yeah, this is how my body fucking moves. Like, <laughs> yes. Right. And I think a lot of people who come from a dance background, they're um they're so so used to trying to please the teacher mm -hmm. that when we tell them like your hip circle is perfect, even yep. though like like and they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and it takes a while to like own up to those yeah. um things. But yeah, I think the pole world is really wonderful in that way that it is not like the other the dance world. Um that a lot of us came from. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about the dance world later. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, another one of those rabbit holes of like, <laughs> how far do you want to go? <laughs> but yes. seriously, like, it's really sad. Uh, unfortunately, like a lot of us came from, I don't know, I hate to even call it like, it is abuse, I guess. Um, like fitting to a certain mold and then but thankful that there is pole dance. <laughs> what did, cause you, what style, what a dance did you do before pole? Yeah, I, I did ballet as well, but okay. I had a different sort of story because my body type was not the exact body type. So I got turned away a, a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, when I did get to college, I had ended up having an eating disorder due to it because I just didn't fit in. And, yep. But, yeah. But you know what? I could still dance and everyone else that is like me can still dance. And, no, you know. but I think that is one of the things I always talk about that I love about pole is that there is no ideal body type for pole. Like I was, I mean, I'm five, eight when I was dancing, I, because I had an eating disorder, um, which I already had you could say the perfect body for it. I still had an eating disorder. You know, ballet is one of those where it's acceptable to sit around and swap purging techniques and, you know, brag about how little you've eaten in the last few, like, it, you know, I mean, the teacher would walk around and like poke you in the butt and be like, why, why are these jiggling? Yeah. Like every, you know, despite the fact there's nothing there, like, yeah, and yet pole is one where it's like, okay, if you're, um, if you're going to be a basketball player, you better be tall or eventually they're going to get to a point where it was like, oh, you're good. But you know, if you want to be a gymnast, if you're tall, you know, so, there, but versus pole, I always tell them like, there is no perfect body style, like short, tall, thin, big, you know, curvy, not like it's all good. Plus I love the fact that I always tell people, I said, pole is the only sport, if you want to call it movement thing that I've ever been exposed to. And I've done a lot of them where you can have a group of people gather around and get excited about the fact that their asses are jiggling. I'm like, yeah. I don't know any other movement in the entire world. I mean, there are some other dances in grad. I have not been exposed to all, but like literally you'd be like, look, it's jiggling. Look, 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 like, and get excited, like entire rooms cheering. I'm like, yes. I mean, that's not something you see very often, right? <laughs> yes, right. I love it so much. Yeah, everyone needs to know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, we'll steer back to some questions. <laughs> um, what is, how, how do you describe your, your teaching style and your training style? There's two different. Um, yeah. my teaching training style. So, I mean, my background, I have a, my graduate degree, I'm a kinesiologist. So mm -hmm. I am very much, I'm a nerd. I totally am. Um, so my teaching style is very much, it's based on physics, but I think over the years is like any of us that have taught, um, learning how to translate stuff to other people's language. Um, and in that, when I say language, that's their movement language It's even their learning style. You know, I am very much a visual and a kinesthetic learner. Some people are very auditory. Um, so learning that 
Um, and as much as I talk a ton here, I'm actually not a talker. I know it's hard to believe. I, I know, right? Um, just like I'm actually totally an introvert. And once again, people sometimes don't believe that. Um, I have my moments. But um, but learning how to uh, try to connect with different learning styles. So that is something that I've tried to over the years. Because I when I did martial arts, I taught. Um, so even though I've only been doing pole since 2012 and then teaching since probably 2013, um, I've been teaching my whole life in one way or another, you know, used to teach, you know, horseback riding, dressage, and then martial arts. And so learning how to translate things and communicate. And, you know, when something isn't getting across, like, how can I adjust this so that it fits to your learning style and to adjust and to not take it of like, you're not understanding me, but like, maybe I'm not speaking your language. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much a nerd when I teach, I break things down into like centripetal force levers, push, pull, all of that. Um, so yeah, technical, very technical. And I'm, I'm very body conscientious as far as my goal. And one of my mantras is live to train another day, um, coming from the martial arts world and also having grown up with four brothers. Um, I grew up very much with the. I'm going to get there. Even if it kills me, like no pain, no gain, you know, kind of more of that crossfit kind of mantra. I do not subscribe to that anymore. To me now it's the, you know what, sometimes you like try something and maybe it's not working. Like give it up like Superman. Okay. I always tell people when you learn Superman superhero, the first time don't work on it for an hour straight until you master it, do it a few times. And when you feel like your thighs are burning, move on with your life and come back to it. Cause otherwise your thighs are going to be bleeding. You're going to hate it. You're never going to want to come back. Like kind of like expose your body to it and then kind of put it to the side and come back. And sometimes you find you come back to it a few days later and it's like, ah, oh, it's there. So, but yeah, so I definitely have a much more, um, injury prevention approach to everything. Um, and even with like dance styles, there's a bazillion variations. It's like, you're talking about, like some people might do something one way or the other. I always look at it as like, you're very, as long as it's not going to potentially cause injury variations are awesome. Right. So like sometimes people are like, well, should this arm be fully extended or should it be bent? And I'm like, well, I'm doing it fully extended, but in this particular move, it's not going to hurt your body duty the way, if that way works better for you. Awesome. I love it because that helps give um, everyone a little bit more ownership of the shapes that their bodies are making. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And just because it works for my body doesn't it mean it works for your body, right? So yeah. It's all yeah. Different. Right. There'll be a lot of times when students will be like, am I doing this right? And then it doesn't look the same, but it is right. Yep. <laughs> yes. No, right. exactly. No, totally. Because we, I mean, our bodies are all different, different flexibility, yep. you know, length of arms, length of torso, you know, comfort with moves, all of those things. So it's going to look different and that's yeah, okay. For sure. I love it. I love that you are also very patient too, and um, are attentive to um, everyone's learning styles because that's I always teenage hard. boys, so... <laughs> <laughs> that should just sum it up right there just like. <laughs> something new every day mm. <laughs> um chris do you have a question um do you do um uh, yeah i have a couple uh, let me get back what kind of like cross training do you do any cross training for your like to add to your full training because i know you're so um, flexible and you're extremely strong I didn't start out flexible or strong. Um, my first pole class where, like I said, I call my official beginning to pull in 2012 after my knee injury. Um, I'd been on bed rest for four months. I had zero strength. I remember they were actually teaching a fireman spin in the class and I couldn't get my feet off the ground. So when I first started pole, I had zero strength, um, flexibility wise. Um, I had, I mean, from being a competitive fighter, um, I was a kicker. Um, cause that's something when you, you know, are five, eight and you're fighting sometimes men part of learning how to fight is also knowing how to pick your fight. And if I'm going toe to toe with someone that's, you know, 200 pounds and six feet, I'm not going to try and punch them out, but I can kick them in the head. Um, so I was a kicker. So I had for a fighter, I was flexible, which meant I could do like a faux split. <laughs> it was not square, but you know, compared to the group of guys, I was fucking amazing. Um, and then of course, you know, you start pull. And when I, of course, then coming off of like knee surgery, all those things, I had no splits no splits. Like 
you could see the Grand Canyon underneath my vagina. Um, I was not touching down. Um, shoulder flexibility, I had none. I always, and this is actually one of my favorites when I teach to people, like, you know, you do those stretches in the beginning where we're like, stand and we'll do this and we'll like push away. I remember when I first started pole and they would do this stretch standing, but I'm crouching down so you can see it. And I would do this and I'd push and I'd be like, can, can you see sky behind my back? Cause I had no shoulder flexibility whatsoever. Like I remember like pushing this. I was like, hey, and nothing. I got nothing. Um, it turns out I actually did have very flexible shoulders, um, but I didn't know that I did. Um, I have a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which uh, means I have a connective tissue issue. Um, and it turns out that my shoulders actually had so much flexibility that, that over the years they had freaked out and gone the opposite. Um, and so I had like no shoulder flexibility. And so I actually started... Oh gosh, what year? I don't remember somewhere a few years. I've been doing pole for a few years and I kind of hit that plateau that so many of us do around like the intermediate level where you're like, I feel like all these tricks I want are like way up here. It was like, I either need like brute strength or crazy flexibility. Like I'm just at this like plateau. And so I decided to actually stretch, you know, instead of just like talk about it or think about it and wonder why I didn't get more flexible. Not that any of us ever do that. Um, <laughs> but, um, I actually started training with Christina of fit and bendy, who is fucking amazing. If any of you have ever worked from her, worked with her, she is my Yoda. Um, she's been my mentor in contortion. And it was amazing to work with her because I'd taken stretch classes before, but never from someone that could actually break it down. I remember actually at one point taking a flexibility class with someone who had been flexi since birth. And we're sitting there like in our splits, you know, she's like got her foot up on like two blocks and the rest of us are there like two feet off the ground. <laughs> and we're sitting there and she looks back and she's like, where do you guys feel this? I was like, listen here, bitch, I'm going to kick you off your blocks. So, oh, I, <laughs> I did. That was my internal monologue. But it was just of like. I didn't know how to get from where I was to where she was. And, you know, she had been a cheerleader her whole life, everything like the thought of feeling stiff wasn't a thing. Um, but yeah, so working with Christina was amazing because it actually like appealed to my educational background in kinesiology of like, here's how the muscle engagement works. Here's how PNF, here's how the active engagement. And it was just like, like Christine and I can get together and have coffee and totally like geek out on like muscle engagement and muscle fibers and like total nerd out. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, so she actually taught me how to teach my body to trust itself. And I found flexibility that I didn't know that I had and literally game changing because, um, depending on how much y'all know about Eller Danlos syndrome, um, I've dislocated, a significant number of joints in my body. Um, my jaw dislocates, my ribs pop out, my shoulders pop out, um, my, you know, ankles, my wrist. Um, I have a, an ankle that'll just randomly dislocate. And so my leg will be like this and suddenly my foot's pointing that way. And then I have to like put it back in my patella. Um, and so basically what happens is that over time in the beginning, they kind of pop out and go back in. I mean, everyone's different. There's varying degrees of it. Um, but eventually over time, they pop out so many times that it damages everything around it. And there's no longer anything to hold it in. Um, I always think of it as like, you know, as a little kid, my brothers had GI Joes and, you know, you pull the leg out, it's got the rubber band. You can like pull the leg out and turn it around backwards. And it's really cool. It's a fun party trick for like the first, like 10 times. And then on the 11th time you turn the leg around and the rubber band snaps. That's kind of how my body goes. Um, so just to kind of give you a little insight into that now, when I sleep now, cause an Eller Danlos does progress as you get older, cause it's degenerative. Um, I have arthritis in my hands. I have since I was in my twenties. Um, but when I sleep at night, I actually have to prop a pillow on both sides. I literally sleep in an igloo because otherwise as I sleep, my shoulders will slide out of the socket. Um, and even throughout like my daily life, like I've had, I've had things before where like when my kids will be like roughhousing wrestling and they'll grab my hand and pull and it starts to dislocate my wrist or so things that like the average person wouldn't think about basically your nervous system is always in this state of stress trying to protect itself. And so it doesn't always mean flexibility. Sometimes it can mean the opposite. So there's some areas I have hyper flexibility and other areas I have much less. <laughs> so it's, it's a constant, um, fun. And when I say fun, I mean like interesting, like a toxic relationship, um, with my body of like, what's it going to be today. And oftentimes like getting it to trust me because <laughs> I don't even trust it sometimes, you know? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, 
So, okay. And I totally lost the question. I don't know. I've gone somewhere else. Where do we start? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. I, no, that drop, was, didn't I? <laughs> that, I think that was awesome. You're, we were talking about different ways that you cross train. Oh, okay. We start on flexibility. Okay. That was the flexibility part. I'm sorry. The others will be much more focused. Um, <laughs> I also, straps used to be one of my primaries um, and straps I actually found is, was great for my shoulders because pull, as much as we're always trying to like, you know, push out of our shoulders, keep them engaged, um, we still tend to sink into them, you know, plus in pull, the pull is the center of the universe and we go around it, right? We're like the earth around the sun. Um, in doing that, that means you're always tilting one side or the other. So straps working on it. And because you now get to be the center of the universe, um, it was actually so good for my shoulders. It actually taught me how to control my shoulders and strengthen them that much more. And I can't say enough about straps as cross training. It's fantastic. So many shoulder issues that pullers have, if they did, you know, even just a, a pull-up bar, a lot of cross training calisthenic stuff with that or straps. Amazing. So I do that. Um, and then of course now as you know, me and my ADD, not that y'all notice that. Um, I tend to go in a lot of directions. Like since um, the, I got a dog, you know, pandemic dog actually had nothing to do with the pandemic, but I got a dog two years ago, border collie took up mountain biking again. And I haven't mountain bike since I was with my ex-husband over a decade or so ago. Um, and it got me back into mountain biking. Cause like I, I didn't do cardio, but like I get out and mountain bike right now, it's fucking hot outside. So, um, but when it's not so hot, like, and that's been something, so I don't know if you call that cross training, but other things I do. And then, uh, I'm going to be 42 next week. So I just decided a week ago that I'm going to start motorcycle track riding. So I just went and bought a bike. I'm going to turn into a track ride. Does that count as cross training hobbies? Are we talking hobbies or <laughs> cause literally I think if I haven't done it, fuck yeah, I want to try it. I love it. Uh, All of these things are on the list. So you can just continue. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, and I also think it's good list. to have options. It's much like how we were saying earlier of like, you know, recreating ourselves. Like, it's also like, there are things I'm like, yeah, my body won't be able to do this later. So I'll do that. Like hand balancing also do also great. So I would say things that I think are complementary to pull the hand balancing stuff, the contortion and the straps or stall bars, calisthenics are complementary. The other things are all just my wanting to do all the things and there's not enough hours in the day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I was really surprised that you said straps were really good as training. Cause when I mm -hmm. look at them, I just feel like, cause I, I'm still waiting to get my genetic tests for EDS, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, just thinking about holding onto the straps and rotating my shoulders. I'm like, no. no. Okay. <laughs> and so on that, okay. And this is one thing. And I've caught, cause I, I actually had, when I would teach in person, the bear, I actually had a lot of people that were sent to me that had joint disorders where people are like, do not train with anyone else. Go train with her. If yeah. done incorrectly, it will fuck you up. Yeah. If done correctly, it is amazing. And straps is one of those that, you know, just like anything, if you have progressions, like, okay, handsprings, handsprings are one of those things. I love teaching because I find handsprings when a lot of students in pole start doing handsprings, I swear that is when the most pole injuries happen. You've got people that are trying to kick up into it before they're ready. They're not doing it correctly. And people end up jacking up their shoulders. Like I see the majority of shoulder injuries are like, like people tell me they have a shoulder thing. I'm like, did you just start handsprings? Yeah. How'd you know? Mm, no, either that or a uh, ribs popping out also that, cause they only do them on one side, but that's the whole thing. Um, oh. but handsprings also one of those, if done correctly, great, fantastic. It's not any harder on your shoulders, your body than anything else. If done incorrectly. Yeah. It's going to fuck you up. So yeah, on that and with straps with straps. So one of the things I love about straps and to kind of break down that joint thing, the place where we hurt ourselves, like when we're under control, when we're, you know, we always like learn things initially and pull with that, like stronghold grip, because it's safe, right? Our shoulders are close to our sides. Our arms are close. Our joints are protected. It's the more our arms start getting out here in, you know, Neverland that we're more prone to injury. The problem is, is that like, you think of the traditional shoulder exercises, they give you those, you know, rotator cuff exercises that doesn't apply to our world. I mean, exactly. I know all of us, any of us that have ever had a shoulder injury, I'm like, yeah, they gave me these things. I'm like, okay. And how is that going to help you when you jack off? Like other than that, I don't see how that crosses over. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, but it's not going to strengthen your shoulders for pull with straps. Everything in straps starts from disengaged. And it, once again, you start with your feet on the ground, not with all your body weight. And so for me, and for those of us that have that joint laxity, 
our shoulders are always wanting to slide up my shoulders. I can't count on my fingers and toes, how many times my shoulders micro dislocate throughout the day, but because I have that strength, they start and they pull back in because I've, I've strengthened that no man's zone, no man's land. Most people only strengthen where they want their shoulders to be, but injuries happen when like we slip and fall and we go outside the normal range. So we're very careful to make sure, you know, that the front of our house looks nice, but then the backyard looks like a train wreck. Right. You know, but and it's the same thing with our bodies. Like we make sure when we're doing the trick, like in front of the camera, it's great, but did you actually train both sides? You know? So that's one of the things I find that straps is fantastic because it works every single range of motion that your shoulders could possibly go into. And if you work on it in a progressive, like listen to your body, train smart, do it in a progressive way. It's fantastic. So yes, do it, but do it carefully. Right. So straps, are the straps the ones that like attach to the pole? No, 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 They, um, they hang from a rigging point. Um, they kind of okay. look, so I always think of straps as being crossed between Olympic rings and silks. So everything you can do on Olympic rings, um, you can do on straps, but not everything you can do on straps can you do on rings. Okay. So, and there's a lot of stuff that like you do on silks that you can kind of cross over to straps and that kind of thing. Straps is like 99% upper body. Like pole is kind of a mix. Like it's a lot of upper body, but you can, you know, do a leg hang, do a pole sit, give your arms a break. Straps, like straps is not something you see as an ambiance piece in performances. Yeah. Like it's pretty much balls deep the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always so impressed with straps performers and then the chain a lot too. of strength. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it's a, it's a lot of strength, but I think I've always loved the challenge of it. Um, and like I said, I love what it's been for my shoulders to teach me how to control my shoulders. And yeah. it's been one of the best things. And there's certain things I'm very careful. Like I don't do, I'm really careful about switches, which is a big straps move because if done correctly, they'll hurt your shoulders. If my shoulders are having a bad day. I'm like, Nope, not doing switches. <laughs> yeah yeah oh my gosh well I'm so thankful that you brought up the fact that you have EDS because um as I'm finding like lots of polars have it and it's just yep. um and when you don't know you have it and you're training um you could be damaging your body because of some like what happened to me I had a lot of movement compensation patterns mm -hmm. to work out of and it's been a backwards Backwards and it's frustrating training. in the beginning because if you have joint laxity, a lot of things take longer to learn. Like handstands were so much harder for me because I had so much range of motion in my shoulders and learning, you have to control your range of motion before you can even get to the trick. Right. Right. Like so it can be very what's frustrating. The normal. Yeah. yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, well, like a strap right here. Right. The strap, no, it's. <laughs> Cause I have that issue too. Like my shoulder goes way. No, it's high. so, it's so great. And even I have, um, like I just recently got a set of stall bars that stand alone. Freaking love them. Cause I don't, I don't like anywhere to put them. I was like, if I put them in here, I might kick them on my pole. I'm like, where do I, but, um, I got a set from go beyond balance that they have like a stand. So you can put them anywhere. Like they don't bolt into the wall, anything, but it's great. Cause they have a pull-up bar. And so I have baby straps that are like 18 inches. And so you, you hook into them, like you put your hands like you would, and you can still do a lot of the straps conditioning with them without having to have a rigging point or anything. And it's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Huh. Well, something to, to think about. I was just thinking about putting stall bars at the studio. <laughs> you know, I think they're amazing. They're great for stretching, for strengthening, yeah, for yeah. warm up. Yeah. There's so much shoulder stuff that stall bars are fantastic for. So yeah, I use mine for warm up, whether I'm doing hand balancing, pull straps, contortion, anything. They're fantastic. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, how do you handle, like when you see students who have like um, maybe shoulders that are not being controlled properly and like, you know, the hypermobile joints, like what do you, how do you, do, how do you bring that up? Cause I, I always like, I'm hard. Like, I don't want to diagnose people, but I also want them to be aware. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, I do find, and, and as I'm sure you found in teaching, <laughs> you can give a recommendation to someone and you can say, Hey, you know, I need you to get, and, and to me, I, I would say I've gotten, I don't want to say aggressive, but, um, confident in having a criteria for my students before I'll let them move to the next step. Like once again, back to the handspring example, cause I think that is where it becomes it. Someone that has hypermobile shoulders, if they're have, having trouble, just stabilizing their shoulders and handspring prep, like even in a butterfly, I'm like, 
you need to not take your legs off the pole because you're going to hurt yourself. And I've had students where I'm like, okay. And I, I have a very, like I teach handspring classes where it's a progression. I'm like, and my online workshops that I'm like, here's step one, do not move to step two until step one is good. And so when I do see students that are having that instability, you know, I always try to like, not announce it in front of the class because sometimes people like, they're just like, my body's different. And sometimes they're self-conscious about it because they don't know why they're weird. You know, we're all weird in our own way. Let's be honest. Um, but you know, our bodies don't move the way that someone else does. And I find, you know, a, I'll try and like, just of like, Hey, do you, you know, do you have some instability? I usually will ask first, not necessarily EDS because you can have hypermobility yep. without having EDS. Yep. Um, but just of like, do you, you know, it looks like you have some hypermobility and sometimes people are like, Oh yeah. And other people are like, Oh, what's that? Um, but I am very much of like, I don't single them out when I give the criteria though. I say, this is step one until this works. You don't go to step two. I don't tell them that it is because of that, because I don't want to be of like, Oh, you're special and you can't do this just of like, it's the same rules for everyone. My rule isn't any different for anyone else. And I just give the broad of like, this is why we don't go to the next step. You know, if, if your shoulder, you know, I have to see a, B and C before you move to step two, because I love you. And I want you to train another day. Um, yeah. and just, you know, telling people, I want you to train smarter, not harder on it. Um, but yeah, I am a stickler for steps. And so it, yeah, it's once again, I don't diagnose. Um, I, I oftentimes will share with people, my experience not necessarily telling them, Hey, I see this in you, but I'm just like, Hey, so I have this thing. So I found for me, you know, and then that's something I more often than not, I get people where they're like, Oh my gosh, I do the same thing. And then it kind of becomes like a, a door opener to like, you know, here's some recommendations. Here's some things that you should add into your daily stuff that will help with that. Mm. Right. And they say like, um, like people who are hypermobile, they say they're like 1% of the population, but I'm finding that it's like way more than that. Okay. Right. Okay, I well, and to like find out like yeah, other people think. No. Like, well, ridiculous. but I, I do find though with that, okay, I, I'm sure a lot of it is the community that we're in. We see it yeah. more because I think, like you said, we do see it. And granted, okay, I was a competitive fighter. Turns out having joint instability as a competitive fighter is not a good sport. I didn't know that at the time because I didn't know yeah. that I had a joint issue. Um, it wasn't until... Uh, let's see, I think it was on one of the patella dislocations where the doctor was like, how did you do that? And he was like, we only see these kind of injuries, like, um, football players or people being hit by cars. And you just like stepped in it, did that. And I was like, I'm special. Um, so that was like one of the first red flags of like, and then actually it was, that's what prompted doing some of the testing. And then my second child also has EDS and that made it, that's one of the markers. Like it's, he's actually even worse than I am. Um, so he's going to have some, he's going to have some trouble with that later. So it's one of those where I hope, I hope he is proactive about it. Um, cause I, I struggle with it and I'm very meticulous about trying to keep it in check as much as possible. And as you know, if you don't, you know, like my leg day is doing stability things for my ankles, my knees and my hips. <laughs> it's not what most people would think of as a leg day. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. I was going to ask you that because I found for myself, like I used to like lift heavy weights and that mm -hmm. was really hurting me. Um, yes, but now I do joints. lower weights. Yeah. Now I do lower yep. weights and like with muscle awareness and like, yes, yeah. Better. I do a lot of single leg. I do single leg squats, single leg deadlifts. Like I do Me very too, low yeah. weight, if not any weight at all, because I just want my knees to stop doing this and my ankles. Like it's all about joint stability for me. Yep. Yeah. I'm so glad you said all of this. Thank you. This is good for me. Good. No, and not just you so many, because I, mean, I, I, I had to learn, I had, to, and this yeah. is why also why I'm so grateful for Christina, even though Christina doesn't mm -hmm. have Ella Danlos, she has some joint laxity and she's worked with a mm -hmm. lot of people. So mm -hmm. for me to actually have someone tell me like, cause okay, backbending stuff was scary. My shoulders, um, like in stretching, Christina is on the very short list, like her and maybe one other person that I will let touch me when I'm stretching. Because, you know, you see, and I'm not a, an advocate of partner stretching, but you see people pushing on people. I'm like, if you touch me, yes, I will go. And I'll keep going until my shoulders pop out, yeah. and which it's scary. And so that's where a lot of my lack of flexibility was, is it was my body, like, don't fall apart literally. Um, but working with Christina and having someone that actually, um, address the fear and realizing like, yes, your body can go there, but until you feel safe, you won't go there. 
So it took me a long time to actually like be able to do a drop back, to do so many things. Like there's a lot of things that a lot of people that had less flexibility than me were able to do because I still had to get to the part where my body was like, we're okay. We're safe. We're strong. You can control this. We're not going to go so far and pass the point of no return that, you know, life as we know it is over. So yeah, it's to actually get to the point where someone actually makes you feel seen and heard and that your, your pain, <laughs> both figuratively and literally, um, is actually addressed. Cause to me, that was huge. Like I remember having people where they're like, Oh, you just like drop back. I'm like, okay. So I just drop back and one shoulder goes that way. And one shoulder goes that way. And I land on my head. Yep. <laughs> so how do I have that not happen? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, well, man, it's such a journey. Like everyone's body is so different and we each have to figure out our own body. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, what advice do you have to pollers that are just getting started? Oh, um, so much. And yet I always, number one recommendation I give to people is enjoy the journey. You know, I think so often we start and we've got all our pull idols and, you know, we see the, you know, people doing spatchcocks and fongies and handsprings. And we want that yesterday and just be like, enjoy where you are every step of the way. You know, we so often I'm like, just enjoy it. Like if you just did a roundabout today and a pirouette, that's fucking awesome. Like, Cause they'll get people with a post, you know, that you know, on Facebook, you see of like, Oh, I just did this move and I know it's not that good. And I'm like, don't apologize. That's a move you weren't doing last week. So I just look at it as like, celebrate every step of the way. Like, don't wait until you consider yourself successful to be proud of yourself, be proud of yourself every step of the way, because the only way you get to successful, whatever success means to you is by every single one of those steps. If you never learn a roundabout, you're not going to get to the point of doing a tuck spin. You're not going to get to the point of learning a handspring. Like it's, you know, one step at a time. So enjoy the journey and listen to your body live to train another day. <laughs> That's yes. also very important. <laughs> I love it. That's such good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of us, we forget about the fun and enjoying it. And yeah. And a lot of times we'll be like, Oh, can you do all those tricks? And be like, no. Yeah. And they'll be like, yep. why? <laughs> Yeah. Well, because I, I like the if, ones that I do. Yes. Well, I was actually, this is interesting thing is I think, and this is like, I don't know if you've encountered this with your joint stuff as well. Um, in my earlier years of pole, cause I'm so old. Um, I did a lot of Chinese pole. Um, like I trained with Cujo, which if any, I mean, he doesn't, Cujo, I don't know if Cujo still teaches Chinese pole, but used, I used to live in the LA area. Amazing. He's also a kinesiologist. So like I freaking loved his teaching style because we could geek out. But anyways, I did a lot of Chinese poll, learned my fongies, learned my kamikazes, learned my pop outs, all those things. I loved them. My joints can't handle those now. Like to me, even a pop out, like pop outs used to be like, <sighs> like I can do 10 of them in a row and like didn't bother me versus now I can't remember a lot. Like I want the thought of doing a pop out because my elbows also dislocate, you know, which is really fun. I might do one pop out and I don't know, is that going to be the last one before my elbow dislocates and doesn't go back in? So there's a lot of things that I've had to adjust over the years. At the time, my elbows were not bad. Now, you know, progression of Eller Danlos, your joints get worse. So there's a, a lot of Chinese pole stuff now where I'm like, you know, I'll have students like, can you demo it? I'm like, no, but I can show you a video of me doing it 10 times before breakfast. Like, I don't think to prove to you. I don't need to prove it to you. And I'm like, I can still teach it because I've done it before. I understand how it works. I can still spot you, but I won't demo it. Cause it's not worth it to me to demo it one time to, you know, appease my ego to make one of us feel better. I'm not even sure who and have it ruin my body. And so, and I've changed the way that I pull, like I used to love all that power pull stuff. And now I'm like, I love me some spinning pole. <laughs> I would do more low flow, but I have carpet now. It's not quite the same, you know, but, but yeah, so I definitely love, we have to adjust for our bodies. And I think sometimes people have this like, Oh, you don't do that move. Oh, how long have you been polling? I'm like, you know what? We all have our own style. Like I always tell people, like, I know pollers that have been doing pole for, you know, 10, 15 years. They don't do handsprings, but their low flow is to fucking die for. So it like, we all have different styles. That's one of the things that's amazing about pole is like, you know, it's like, you know, in the beginning people are like, oh, I do pole. And you're like, well, you know, there's also there's tricks, there's spinning pole, there's static, there's low flow. And then of course now just in low flow, you've got like hard style, fluid style, like twerking, like there's so many genres, like you can make it whatever you want. And so finding your style 
is awesome. And I think often as people try to compare where it's like, how long have you been doing pole? Oh, you only do that floor stuff. I'm like, do you realize like to make your leg waves look like they're fluid and flowing? Do you know how many hours that took? It didn't take any less hours than that person that learned how to do a Fonji. So I think right. there is oftentimes that like, I'm like, you're comparing apples and oranges. Like, don't even try. <laughs> it's the problem with us artists. We make it all look so easy that everyone just thinks they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> like right? just it's do a blessing everything. and a curse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. true. But right, we're not all, we're not a real pole dancer until we've got like an Aisha. Yeah. No. And I don't, yeah, I don't subscribe to that. No, but I think, okay. And this is one that also plays into the flexiness. Um, people that are lurdotic or an archie lower back tend to have a harder time inverting. And so you get a lot of people where, yeah, yeah, you get some people where like their first pole class are like, Oh, I just inverted. And then you get people that they've been doing pole for like two, three years and they can't invert. And part of it, cause that lurdotic, that archie lower back, most people are going from here. They're going from here. So they have to, yeah. you know, find here and then be able to go up. And a lot of my find, it starts to kind of affect their identity where they're like, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, you know, people, they talk about what level and they're like, well, I mean, I can't, I've been doing pole for five years, but I can't invert. So I guess I'm a beginner. I'm like, no, like there are so many other ways to get inverted that you can drop down into. It doesn't make you any less of a polar. Like there is one invert. There's like however many different ways that you can descend down into an invert. But I do find that is one area where I've kind of changed how I determine levels. Like even when I teach workshops, I won't say you have to be inverting. I say you need to be comfortable getting into an inverted position. I don't care if you invert up, drop down into it, because those people that have the archy lower back were like, they feel like it makes them less of a puller. Cause like, it's not like I'm not working on it, but it's like, not connecting. I'm like, okay, like that doesn't mean that you're any less than that person that inverted the first day. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's such a good example too, for like others who see like on the outside and be like, oh, like I don't have to put that much pressure on myself. I can literally just have fun. Like, like you said before. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And enjoy what, are you having a good time? Yes. Okay. Mission accomplished. (laughs) Enjoy the superhuman in all of its different ways. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. For sure. (laughs) It's it's sad. I feel like sometimes competitions are to blame for that level thing. Like you have to do this at this and you're right. It's not really like that. There's so many ways to get upside down without inverting. Um, yeah. So it looks like even pole dance, it has some things like ballet that you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> right. It happens. It happens. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, have you done any competitions or anything? Um, yeah. So I, I've performed a lot, um, including I did the whole Snoop Dogg performance thing, um, done a bunch of other performances. I used to perform with some different performance groups um, on area or like aerial stuff, other things like that. Um, I'm not, you know, like some people live for the performance. I'm indifferent to it. Like, honestly, when I got the contact, the, the invite to go perform with Snoop, I honestly didn't want, I was like, like, I'm not a starstruck person. I mean, to me, I'm like, I'm more of like a people person, like who someone is on TV on stage isn't necessarily who they are in person. I'm more of like, who are you actually like, you know, what is your persona is not the same as who you are sometimes. Um, so I honestly wasn't even going to do the Snoop Dogg thing, but at the time, let's see how many years ago is that my son, see 17, I think my son was 13 at the time, 13, 14. Um, and I kind of like in passing was like, oh yeah, I got this invitation to go perform with Snoop, but I don't think I'm gonna do it. My son was like, oh, what? He was like, what do you mean you're not going to? And I was like, I was like, okay, fine. So I messaged them back and said, okay, I will perform, but only if I can bring my son with me and he can hang out backstage. And so the guy was like, okay, let me get back to you. And it's like, yes, yes, you can. So um, turns out having a mother that's a pole dancer has its perks. Um, so my son got to go backstage, hang out. Like I was on, and get this, and this is also, okay, performing, I'm sure a lot of you say like, I, my style, like, as you see my YouTube channel, stuff, so my ass is covered. Like I couldn't care less who sees my ass, my nipples, any of those, but you know, there's like the algorithms and all that. Like I definitely have found my niche in being more of like, um, on the conservative side, not cause I like, I honestly don't care. I'm just like, and, and here's also the part I literally have bins full of pull clothes. I wear the exact same fucking thing every time. I'm just like, I, I literally wash it, pull it back out and put it on. So, um, <laughs> so not creative of that. I'm like, I don't care anyways, but performing on stage with Snoop, 
I'm wearing a thong. One time I was wearing a monokini, like it's up my ass and thigh high boots. And my 13 year old son is on the outside and the sidelines filming his mom, um, <laughs> which he's grown up with this. I mean, I used to take him when I started training up in LA, he would go with me. Sometimes he was my little mini me. He used to do aerial. He's performed with circus groups when he was younger. Um, and I mean, he would go to pole studios with me. He, so, I mean, literally even there we're backstage with Snoop and like the girls are like changing. He's just like, like he's grown up with this, like meh. Um, but yeah, like he's standing backstage, like I'm on performing and literally Snoop came up and was standing next to him. And he was like, what's up little man. He was like, so yeah, he got a selfie with Snoop, all of that. But this was actually, and this is something actually a question that I hear a lot of pollers ask of like, as parents, people that keep it on the down low of like not wanting their kids to know, or not wanting family, friends to know things like that. When I first started poll, um, you know, Facebook wasn't as much of a thing. Um, I remember the first time I got a leg hang, I posted the picture on Facebook and one of my brothers, um, who humorously, he is very into porn, um, and no judgment there. I mean, I'm a big fan, but, um, he commented on Facebook and said, oh my gosh, my little sister's now doing soft porn. And I was like, seriously, like, yes, <laughs> but I was like, really, I'm wearing a tank top and like boy shorts. But anyways, so that was like my first ever like social media of like me on a pole from there. And once again, I have boys that are now teenagers when they were about junior high. Um, I had one of my sons come home from school and upset because he'd been teased at school. And the part about it that was interesting is that all of the kids at that age, I mean, nowadays, every kid has a phone at that time. It wasn't as much, but he was being teased because the kids were saying that his mom was a pole dancer, a stripper or whatever. They didn't even, he didn't even know that was. Um, but the interesting part was that didn't come from the kids. It came from the parents. The only way that those parents even knew what I did is because they were people that were friends with me on Facebook, but this is where the shit gets good. So best comeback answer ever as the kids are teasing. So my little son who went to the Snoop Dogg thing, Snoop Dogg concert with me, um, as he was getting ready that he told his friends, he was like, I'm going to a Snoop Dogg concert. My mom is performing. And one of the kids came up and he was like, Psh. he's like, dude, your mom's a stripper. And here's the best part. My son didn't try to, she's not a stripper. Cause that's when we're like, I've talked to him. I'm like, dude, I have like, personally, I have never been honestly like props to all of them. I'm not a touchy person. Like with my friends, I will motorboat you. If I don't know you don't touch me, I will break your finger. So I would probably not make a very good stripper, the whole touching thing. Like even just get close. I'm like, don't touch me. Mother. But once again, props to all of them. But my, my son, like we've had discussions about, I'm like, I have never been, but there's nothing negative about that at all. My son doesn't try to defend it. Doesn't try to say my mom's not a stripper. Literally his only answer. He said, yeah, but my mom can beat up your dad. And he just walked away. And I was just like, best answer ever. Cause a, like I said, I love the fact that he didn't try to like demean downplay anything of what I did. And also it was the truth. Cause I took, could beat up his dad. So, no. <laughs> but yeah, so yes. So I have performed a lot, um, competitions. I prepped for one competition years ago when I was new to teaching and right before the competition, I had a whoopsie, <laughs> something happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you could call it an injury. Um, how real do we want to get here? Okay. Um, my boobs are fake. I popped an implant. <laughs> so I was prepping for the competition and I got my boobs after my kids were born. Like that was actually one of my like, okay, after kids, I was like, there, man, got boobs. One of my criteria at the time. Oh yeah. I was also a competitive volleyball player. I had to be able to still play volleyball. So my boobs had to be small enough. I could still hit a volleyball. Um, but at the time I had saline implants, I was prepping for the competition and it was like two, no, it was like two, three weeks before the competition. And I popped an implant, literally had one boob, <laughs> which meant then I'm trying to get in and get it fixed. And I remember some people like the, the owner of the studio was still trying to push me to do the competition. She was like, well, why don't you just like stuff that side? And I was like, no. <laughs> so of course then, you know, surgery had to get it fixed, all that stuff. By the time I was back to like, Hey, I want to do this again. I was teaching a lot and I now had students that were competing. And at that time we didn't have all the competitions we have now. I mean, now there's a competition every weekend and five on Thursday and different levels and all that. At the time there was only a handful a year and there was oftentimes only one category or maybe a pros and an amateurs. And that was it. And so I, I had had competitions come up that I was going to, and then I had students that were competing and it was, to me, it was, 
I don't need to compete. I mean, as a competitive fighter, I used to compete every weekend. Um, I, it, to me, it was one where they want to compete and I'm not going to take away from their moment. So I've judged a lot of competitions all over the world, but yeah, no. So no, never competed in pole, which people are usually amazed. They're like what? Never I'm like, no cats out of the bag. There you go. There's my dirty little secret. You have lived so much. Right. <laughs> and broken a lot of shit, right? That's always tell him like I'm very hard on my toys, all of them. <laughs> I would have been, I would have felt so embarrassed. I would be like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Hot mess here. Hot mess. Oh yeah. my god. I love her. So look at you. You're like inspiring people no matter what has happened to you. It's still so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Right, and you just take whatever happens, and you're like, "All right, <laughs> plot twist," you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I wanted to ask you um, because uh, of you are a wonderful business person as well as you know a pole teacher and everything else that you do, and I I noticed like, and I've taken advantage of your free tutorials, and I've learned so many tricks from you, um, and you've given that to us for free. And I wanted to know how you um, balance giving away free stuff and and paid things. Yeah, because that's yeah. such like a hard thing to yep. to figure out to find that. Yeah, to feel <laughs> yeah. like well, what's it? If Reach. you're giving the milk away for free, nobody's going to buy yeah. a cow or something like that. Yeah. Um, so here's a little like um, I guess uh, once again back to how like I'd said my teaching style of like I'm a nerd in the pole world. Um, you know. Yes, I've gotten better in pole over the years. I also have very much taken the nerdy approach and I, I am not the best polar in the world, far from it, but it turns out you take a nerd and you tell her to sink or swim after, you know, marriage that ended well and literally at 40 or slightly before 40, having to recreate myself. So I took a hobby and I turned it into a, you know, income with multiple zeros that supports me. Um, and I took the nerdy approach. I learned how to market. Um, that's actually something I do now that I don't advertise. And I only take on one or two clients at a time is I do mentoring brand building and business building where I, I have some people, I've had a couple of clients that have come to me and been like, I want to do something, but I'm not sure what or how. And I've literally taken that of like, okay, like basically like, especially in pandemic, I had people who were like, I need to find some way, like a lot of people that were performing artists, how do I recreate myself? And so, you know, taking something and how do you monetize it? How do you turn it to an online business? How to create passive income? Um, I mean, for example, uh, you know, I wake up in the morning and I have money in my bank account every day while I'm sleeping because I've created a, I mean, there's, there's arguments on what, it, you know, passive income. I mean, you still work for it, but you know, I don't have to sit down. It's not an hour per hour income. So years ago in pull, as much as I loved pull and also realizing that my body was failing me, um, even though I was, you know, doing all the right things, trying to take care of it, our bodies all fall apart. Some of us faster than others due to, you know, genetic things and knowing I won't be able to do this maybe someday. I don't know. Or even heaven forbid injury ailment, or, you know, I mean, can you imagine if a pandemic hit and, you know, studios closed? Um, <laughs> I mean, that would be crazy, but, um, <laughs> But basically I had this of like, I need to find a way that I'm not going to be destitute if what I do in person, like what, it, like I don't have a retirement. Like, so when I left my marriage, I left with nothing. So I had put my whole life, everything into something and left with nothing. I left with two amazing boys. Do I say that? worth the world, but, um, financially turns out you can't sell your children when they're teenagers. Nobody wants them. Um, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so I went the nerdy approach. I learned how to market. So my YouTube channel on that, um, I get paid from YouTube. So every time someone watches it, it's not a ton. Okay. So unless you are a gamer or some of the people that do stupid shit, you're not going to make millions off of YouTube. Um, so I get a few hundred bucks a month. It's great to have for me. My YouTube channel is a funnel. So my YouTube channel funnels to my website, to my other programs. It's the way that I've spread my brand all over the world. I was on an airplane to Bali one time and the flight attendant came up to me and was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be rude, but are you Elizabeth B. Fit? My boyfriend was like, he was like, are you kidding me? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's like brand recognition. I mean, without putting stuff out there. So that's where like the free stuff, um, A, 
if you don't put it out there, you can be the best in the world at what you do. But if nobody knows about you, it doesn't matter. You can have the best product, the best ability, the best, whatever it is. But if you don't get the word out there, nobody knows. I go with the approach of I'm not necessarily the best, but I'm really good at bugging people and getting it out there. So they know I'm there. Um, and that like a lot of people know who Elizabeth Beef it is, even if they've never met me in person. Um, so that's part of the reason why I do the YouTube channel. Also on that, um, I have a soft spot in my heart of when I first started poll, I couldn't afford to go to class. I didn't have the time, the money, the resources. And yet at the same time, I think that what a lot of us get from poll mentally, physically, emotionally, in so many ways is gold. And so that is also my way of like, I'm, I, I always want to, I, I want to give people what I have found. Um, and so that also is like in the YouTube, like, yes, I want money from people. I love that. I love money. Um, but at the same time, I also want to share what I have with other people. Cause I was at one point in my life in a place where I didn't have money to spare. So it's sort of my way of trying to find that balance of not making it unobtainable. So my YouTube channel is a funnel. People go to my YouTube channel from there. They hear about my programs. I now have online programs, which I was in the process of building and then pandemic hit. I was actually in beta testing mode and beta testing got sped up real fast. I had a few kinks to work out. So I ended up launching my online programs when pandemic hit. I even had people where they're like, wow, you were on that. And I'm like, yeah, I was already on it. Like I'd already been building it for a year or so before, like, you know, um, so yeah, so I run online programs. I have a poll program. That's three different levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Um, I also have a flexibility program, but I created basically because I had like aerialists and non poll people where they're like, I, you know, I want to learn your flexibility stuff or your hand balancing stuff, but I'm not a poll person. So the flexibility program is, you know, if you're not a polar, there you go. Um, and it, for me, it's made it so that I'm able to help a farther spread of people without exhausting me. Um, as I said earlier, I'm an introvert. I love people, but I love people in small doses. And so I found for me, I am a better person with people. I have, I have more to give when I can serve what I give. So taking time for myself. Um, I love teaching. If I try to teach too much and give too much, eventually I start to not like people anymore. <laughs> So to me, my online program has been a great way. Like people that are in the program, I have a, an app that I've added in where it's for members only. And it's almost like having, um, our own personal, like video chat. And it's great because they can be working on a combo and be like, Hey, I just did this combo. It's not working. And it's been great. Cause sometimes we'll go on there. Like some people will, like they'll post their bloopers and be like, so I tried this shit today. This is how it went. And it's also just been a great community builder. Cause as all of us know, sometimes we feel like we're the only one when we're like, man, my training sucked. Um, so it's nice to have that community option for people to actually like bond. We're like, Oh, we're, they're both working on, you know, module three and this move. And this person's like, well, I did that. So yeah. So the online program, I love it because it's mostly it's hundred percent pre-recorded. So it works for every time zone, every schedule, as much as I love teaching in-person stuff, not everyone's schedule syncs. Right. But with the pre recorded, you know, got people all over the world that are in my program. Um, and then the nice thing is then having, like, I have a, a student that's in Germany. And so I'll wake up in the morning and she'll have sent me a video of what she's working on. And of course, I'll leave her a message. And then sometimes it hits her as she's going. So we're on totally different time zones. But because we can send that interaction, it works out. So, but yeah, so that's kind of how I find the balance with it. Um, but yeah, the marketing part is a whole other, if, you know, should you want to get into that? But yeah, that is something that once again, you go down that rabbit hole and I will geek out. And so, yes. <laughs> so once again, I'm a nerd. We are the same way. I like, <laughs> love it. I, during Corona, I took the time to learn um, computer software programming. Yeah. So we're working on our marketing, all that now. So we'll nerd out and geek out with you. Oh yeah. Bring it, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Thank you for, for talking a little bit about the business side of things. Cause I find like, um, there was two studios that I used to go to and they both shut down just because the, the business side of it became too overwhelming for the owner. And, you know, like we should all have our, our studios and, and not have to worry about juggling all the different hats. And yeah, it's nice that you offer resources because yeah. it's hard to find. Yeah. yeah. And I find, I mean, there's a lot of studios, as you know, running a studio is not just a matter of knowing how to teach pole. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes. It's literally the iceberg that the Titanic hit. Yeah. <laughs> people are like, oh, you just like teach some classes. And you're like, 
don't look at all that. <laughs> right? <laughs> going on back there. Yes, but it's definitely worth it. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so you put uh, a lot of your whole focus in your YouTube, um, because I noticed you have you have a lot of followers on Instagram, but your YouTube is like really where your like all your amazing content is. So that's yeah. your main funnel system. Um, it is one of sorry, one second. I that's have okay. a session coming up in just a second, and I just want to tell her that the time on it to confirm, just because we're running a little. I don't know if we're running late. I'm running late, so. Sorry, super rude. Um, if it was up to us, we'll talk for hours. No, you're totally, I know. Like I said, I thought I'd be done with you all an hour. Now I'm like, hey, we'll be friends and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, sorry. Can you say that again, Chris? Um, so um, you really put a lot of your um, focus yeah, on YouTube, your YouTube. But then Instagram. Because I see you have a, mate, a lot of followers on Instagram, but all your beautiful, I mean, you have beautiful work everywhere, but I notice a lot of your business is through the YouTube. And that's mm -hmm. where a lot of, that's where everybody yes. gets like the amazing free content. So um, in my business building stuff, and it depends on the business, like when I work with, with clients consulting on this, um, one of the first things is, you know, once again, talking about marketing and here's, you know, here's my little like marketing 101. Um, who owns YouTube? Anyone? Yes, I fucking forgot. Oh my god! Google, I do. Google, <laughs> Google owns YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> so you're Google right. owns YouTube, and YouTube yeah. is the number one search engine. Yes. Okay. So by <laughs> getting stuff on YouTube, that means when someone just goes on Google and searches pole dancing, what's going to come up? If you search something on Google, it. I mean. The other day I was, uh, I want to know what kind of oil to put in my new R3 motorcycle. I was like, what kind of, and sure enough, it doesn't just bring up what kind of oil. It brings up a bunch of YouTube videos at the top of the list, yeah. top of the list. You're so right. I don't pay for advertising, but yeah. I end up there because I've basically harnessed, you know, Google wants to make money. So I'll just jump on that bandwagon and they want to yeah. make money. So, so using YouTube is, you know, YouTube wants to promote YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, YouTube helps promote you. So okay. that's one of the reasons. Um, and then, yes, I own Instagram, I would say, is where I made my name in the polling industry. As we all know, it is not so easy to build an Instagram account nowadays, right? I mean, my Instagram followers have literally been at the same point for like, I don't know, the last two years. Honestly, I couldn't give a rat's ass. Um, my focus now on Instagram is connection, if that, which I actually find like Facebook and then through my program. And I definitely have, like, yes, I still market but um, connecting with the clients that I'm working with. Because once again, I only have so much bandwidth and much like, like that second there where I was really rude and wrote a message. I try to be very present. I know I just showed a perfect example of not, but I try to like, <laughs> if I'm with you, I'm with you, right? Mm. So the students that are in my program really honing on them. And like lately I've been directing a lot of my attention to like the Facebook groups. Like I literally go on, I would say I try to at least two to three times a oh, week. Yeah. Just go on Facebook in the group. I've seen you in there. Oh, maybe yeah. that's where we size. Okay, maybe that's it. Yes. Okay, it is. It totally is. Okay, now I recommend. It. Okay, yeah. But just going on, and you'll see someone that's like, I just learned this move the other day, and like giving back to the community and connecting. So, yeah. and in doing that, um, a, I want to encourage people that are new to poll. B, it also gets my name out there. So yes, there is a selfish intent, but it's also my way of giving back. I don't want to just show up when I'm marketing something and be like, Hey, you don't know me, but I really want your money. Instead, it's the, you know, Oh, this person that, you know, always, you know, gives feedback about my video and, you know, said she likes my pull shorts and all these things. It turns out she has a program. So mm -hmm. to me, it's one of those of, I think the more we give to the community, the more community there is for us. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I was just so, about to mention like the way that you comment and everything, it's always authentic. It's never like salesperson-y. Um, your emails so are not like overwhelming. They're always informational. Oh, and I mean, you're doing it right. I, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate And And I will say that that is actually something when I do business, and this has actually been a huge step for me. Um, and I actually have a client that I've recently worked with. Um, confidence, much like I talk about that woman in the very first class, confidence has not been something that came naturally for me. Um, I grew up child number six out of seven. I grew up a face in the crowd. 
um, went on to be in a very unhealthy narcissistic relationship for many years of my life, being reminded that I was not good enough for much of my life, um, including, you know, some other traumatic experiences from my childhood. But once again, should you want to set aside like 10 hours of your time, we can delve into the psychological trauma there. But, um, but for me, a lot of like, when I first started doing pole and, and actually like promoting myself is not something that came natural. It was like a, do you want to learn from me? Like I found myself, I always made myself small. And so for me, like what you were saying about the authenticity, I'm very conscientious. And I don't know if what I don't post every day. I'll go through periods where I'll sometimes post every day and there'll be nothing for a week because I'm not on a schedule. I'm on a, you know, when I feel like I genuinely have something to give, I want to give. I'm not going to give because I feel like I have to, because that's what you're supposed to do. If you're, you know, marketing something to me, it's, I'm here to give. And if I have nothing to give, hold, you know, <laughs> build up before you do. So I try to be very conscientious of not going on unless I feel like I have something to give back. That's really good that's, advice. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super good advice. And that's a relief too, because sometimes you think like you have to post every day to stay relevant, but yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> And, and like, I, like I was able to feel your authenticity, um, people can feel when you're not being authentic and they, they'll know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I yeah. I've, I've, I've been on the other side of that. You know, I always yeah. tell my son, I say, we learn something from everyone we meet in our lives, you know, just like, you know, not such the best marriage, but I don't regret it. I learned a lot. Um, we learn something from everyone we meet. Sometimes we learn the person we want to be. Sometimes we learn the person we don't want to be. So, and I've been on the other side of that, of when I was newer to pull, meeting some of my pull idols and realizing when I met them in person, it, it was not, let's just say they weren't my pull idols after that. Ah, that's such a bummer when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's an online persona. (laughs) I don't think I've had that experience yet, but I have heard it and I am sad <laughs> so I far. hope you don't I hope you don't have that experience Chris yeah I mean most most that is not the case that's the exception not the norm you know but I know people I have uh, someone who's I've known for years in poll and she said that she walked out of workshops crying because the person teaching the workshop told her that maybe poll wasn't really her thing and I was like wow are you kidding me <laughs> I was like I want to be the reason why someone decides to start poll not the reason why someone gives up on it I know. Oh. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. That's Anyways, what else we got? <laughs> I'm going to have to wrap what? it up soon. I know I've like been talking your ears off, but I have another one. Not at all. Soon. Yeah, no, for sure. We, we, I, I have one more question. Bring it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all? Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> no, I have, I know, I have, I have, I have other questions. I we can do more a part two one. later. Trust me, I'm down for a part <laughs> right? two. Like, I would totally Don't be down. Don't put me good time. <laughs> <laughs> like, and next time you be like, we're gonna set aside two hours because that bitch can talk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll roll a joint and everything. I <laughs> we'll love it. Be <laughs> <laughs> like, now we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what you're in for, right? <laughs> I love it. There's nothing um, wrong with the, that. Huh? The, only last burning question that I have is like you do so many things like do you have any free time and if you do have free time what do you do in your free time (laughs) to find free time I mean I everything I do is I I don't know I mean I mean I'm not sure how you define that because no Uh, I I don't have a lot of time where I'm sitting still but I go ride my motorcycle I go for mountain uh, bike rides that's it yeah so I I don't sit still very often if I do I fall asleep Mm -hmm. um (laughs) But yeah, I actually, t- that is one of the things of, and this is, once again, this is starting to delve into a whole other, um, you know, <laughs> another rabbit hole, um, but gotten to a point in my business, in my life where I'm in a good place financially and realizing that I'm in the place that I had dreamed of five years ago or three years ago. Yeah. Like I'm a very, I'm not a new year's Eve goal kind of person. I'm like an every month, every, you know. And I write down, well, I'm like, oh, I, someday I'd like, I can look back at goals or I remember at one point writing, someday I'd like to travel and teach workshops. And I was like, and to look back and be like, shit, I did all that. Like all these different things that I've done. 
Um, so where I am now, where like I said, majority of my income comes off of my program. Like I teach, I teach a maximum of five privates a week and I teach in person one day a month and I teach live virtual classes one day a month. Sometimes I'll add some flex classes in and occasionally I'll travel and teach workshops if it's somewhere I want to go and people I want to see and if they offer to pay me enough. So <laughs> most of my income comes off of my online programs, which means most days, you know, I take a break at about noon and puppy and I go, well, when it's not fucking hot outside, puppy and I go mountain biking or go explore, or go to the river, and then I'll come back in the evening and work for it. But I have a really good life. And to me, this is, I mean, on so many levels of um, coming from where I came from and the empowerment that I've gotten from pole and the community and outside of that, like I've done a lot of work, um, you know, in, and once again, I know I keep referring back to my marriage, which is not the topic of this, but I feel like it does play in. I actually find, I, I've lost count how many women I know that either A, came to pole as they came out of a relationship or after starting pole, left an unhealthy relationship because it gave them the confidence in themselves to realize that they didn't need to stick around for that. Um, so, I mean, our relationships make a big impact in our life, whether they're, you know, romantic, you know, even family relations, all, all of that. So for me to get to a point where, you know, one of my goals, I don't know, five years ago or whatever it was of setting out on my own, leaving my marriage with nothing but my ex's debt, which was fun. Um, and my goal was to be able to create a safe place for my children that they could be themselves, whoever that was, because that wasn't something that I had grown up with or had in my marriage. And to have gotten to the point where financially I'm stable financially, my kids are in a good spot where, you know, they don't have to wonder if we're going to be able to pay rent next month. Um, and even to be at a point where I'm mentally in a healthy enough relationship that I can be a good mom for my kids, because when we're not taking care of ourselves, it's really hard to take care of someone else. And I'm sure there's, and I, I know there's a lot of pullers out there that um, being a mom and being there for your kids when you're just trying to keep your own shit together is really hard. So, and to be to a point now where except my son, my oldest son is almost 19. And I mean, I, I think maybe three, four days ago after some, you know, he's thinking about moving out of the house. Um, but we'd had some in-depth conversation about life and goals and things like that. And at the end of it, he came up and gave me a hug and said, mom, I really appreciate you talking to me. And I really appreciate everything that you do. Of course, like, you, did. like, <laughs> you know, so it's one of those of like, I mean, have I fucked up in a lot of ways? Fuck yeah. I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, <laughs> am I going to make more mistakes? Fuck yeah. But I feel like I'm going in a really good direction. I find found a place that is a safe place. And I think anyone who has been in an unsafe relationship, whether that's emotionally, mentally, physically, that's huge. And it's really hard to grow, whether it's, you know, in what you're doing with pull, any of those things. So to be in a place where I could build my business, I, I don't know, like I said, that's, that's huge for me. So yes, you are amazing. Like yeah. so amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Truly, oh, truly man. Are. I do have another question. I know you have to go, do you have to go? Okay. Well, we nope. You got like two minutes. Yes. <laughs> okay. My favorite question always usually to ask is what is your favorite pole move or like your pole nemesis, the pole trick that like you hated and it took you forever. <laughs> okay. I love this. Okay. So a, my favorite pole move and my pole wifey would attest to this. My pole wifey is Aurora. If any of y'all know, they pull in the Bay area. Um, but my po favorite pole move is a brass monkey. I just love it. Because there's so many different ways into it, out of it. It's one of those, like, you don't have to be an inverter. You could drop down into it. Like, I have a lot of students that, like, learning how to just send down to a brass monkey was their first time being upside down for a lot of them. So I'm like, I freaking love brass monkey. Like, I feel like it is the most, not, I mean, not dynamic in a movement way, multifaceted. Like, how many different ways into it? How many different ways out of it? There's so many moves that come from it. So I, it's my favorite. Brass monkey. Yep. Um, nemesis move I can't nothing particular comes to mind but I do have to say this back to Fonji's when I talked about learning um, Chinese pole uh, at that time when I first started pole and you know any of you that have been around a pole for a while when we first started pole if you could do a leg hang that was like 
you know, in a pole competition, if someone busts out a handspring, they were a fucking god, right? It was like, oh my gosh, they didn't do hands. Versus nowadays, it was like, if you can't do a handspring, what kind of polar are you, right? Like pole is more so much. Um, so at that time, as I was like teaching and, you know, wanting to build something in pole, I wasn't sure what that was at the time. I had this thing in my head of like, well, if you want to be any kind of legit pole dancer, you have to be able to do a fanji. So learned how to do fanjis. Like I said, I used to work as a Chinese pole coach, learned my fanjis. I could do them. I could do a few of them in a row, whatever. Every few months I would check back in, you know, check my back pocket, make sure that fanji was still there. And it took me months afterwards to finally admit at first in a quiet whisper, I don't like fanjis. I actually don't like them. But it was like, I felt like I couldn't admit that because then people would be like, I can't believe you, what kind of polar, but I just, like I said, I don't know where that came from, but it was just like, like I said, I, I could do them and fine. I'd done a bazillion of them. I just didn't love them. Like Samantha Starr, Heidi Coker are like the bomb ass diggities of Fonji's. Like the two of them like eats like Fonji 360s and front backs. I'm like, they fucking love Fonji's. Fonji's love them. But I just was like, so it took me a really long time to say it out loud. Like at first it was like a whisper in the dark. And then I finally was the point where I was like, my name is Elizabeth, I'm a pole dancer and I don't like fongies. So yeah. We'll definitely so be sure to- Like, I don't know where that comes from. I just like, not my favorite move. Just we'll for me sure personally. Just Turn for this me personally. Into a clip so everyone will know. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I, it's not like I see I them and I throw that. up. Like for other people, I'm like, if that's your favorite move, awesome. But I'm like, mm -hmm. it's just one of those where I'm like, after a while, I was like, why do I keep doing these? I don't really like them. <laughs> like why? <sighs> so, and that is one of those things when I teach and I always tell people, I'm like, try each move, but it's also okay to admit that you don't like a move just because someone's yeah. teaching it to you and maybe you loved it on the other person. You're like, oh, I want to try that. And then you try it and you're like, this move fucking sucks. I don't want to do it. And like I said, it's not like the Fonji hurt, like I could do it, I could do it successfully, whatever. I was just like, meh. So yeah, I don't like Fonji's. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> I would say don't tell, but you know, cat's out of the bag. Hey, it's good. Everyone will hear it. It's like you said, we all need to be able It's like you said, we all need to be able to say, I don't like to do it. Yes. I can do it, I just don't want to. Yes. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Because there are so many moves in pole. Like, okay, if there's one or two moves you don't do, trust me, there's so many moves in pole that you will still never do. Like, it's not like you're going to run out of moves and be like, oh, I would have done them all, but then there's these two I don't like. Like, <laughs> no, there's plenty, plenty more, plenty to go around. So try them, don't like them, that's fine. Move on with your life. Yay. Yeah. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for spending oh, this time with us you. and sharing all I of really your wonderful stories. And you're, like oh. I said, your stories were very um, surprising. Random? So it's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have warned you. I'm sorry. Right. How many times Not I was like, wait, what was the question? Where do we start? <laughs> like I said, did you want to do a part two? And this time you can send me the questions. You'd be like, only answer these things. <laughs> We could definitely do a part two, but there will not be rules. This was fun. <laughs> we'll sit down with a cocktail next time. I'm like, okay, shit's about to get real. <laughs> Sounds like a good time. Don't tap me. Don't tap me. Oh my gosh, I love it. Oh, so much. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Like I said, super honored to be asked to, to be interviewed. I was like, made me feel like a superstar. So I feel like I, I can check that off my list star. now. So I appreciate it very much. Yes. We're so you honored want... that you said yes, because you no, are. Right? Like, just, like I said, literally now after talking to you, I was like, you want to hang out? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, did you want to plug any of um, your online stuff for, for listeners? I, would, I already kind of did. I don't know if you noticed, I kind of snuck that in there earlier. But yeah, I have <laughs> online programs. Um, I only do launches every few months. Uh, one of them, the enrollment period is today. I don't know when this is airing, but it'll probably be closed by then. Um, but yeah, so uh, my website, uh, elizabethbfit.com has all kinds of stuff. I have online workshops that are available all the time. Um, I do virtual privates too, but like I kind of mentioned before, I only accept a limited number of spots. Like I'll get people who are like, oh, can you do one tomorrow? And I'm like, no, but I can put you in in like three weeks. Um, 
and I do travel to workshops. So make me an offer. If it's a place I want to go to, then I'm like more inclined. If it's a place I don't want to go to, you know, sweeten the deal, maybe. Um, (laughs) Like one of the studios I go back to every year is in Appleton, Wisconsin. If it wasn't for the fact that I love all of them, I wouldn't be going back to Appleton, Wisconsin. No offense. Like, but I freaking love all the people there. They're amazing. So like I said, you gotta, you know. (laughs) So yes, I do travel and teach workshops um, and uh, my online resources are all there. And I always just welcome people to like ask me questions. So, I mean, I, you know, I get people like, hey, I'm trying to figure out this move. And I'm like, hey, here's a YouTube video. So feel free to reach out. Oh, thank you for being so accessible and patient and wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, thank well, you it was all great YouTube meeting work. all of you. <laughs> for yeah. sure. Thank you so much. Well, we usually um, have a silly sign off where we show, we reveal that we're wearing heels. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Let's we got to start. Probably so people. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank y'all for so tuning in <laughs> thank you so much my name is mandy mack <laughs> and i am chris river and we are with elizabeth elizabeth b finn we are signing off at poll on the call <laughs> yes i did off to the next time oh, no. oh, we're matching today <laughs> you're too funny i love it <laughs>